your goodness now would be desperate without your love slain to the darkness and if it was in Good to see you today. Give them a smile. Give them a handshake. High five. He already knows, but but I don't know if you know, but but 40, 48 days, y'all. 48 days. 48 days until what? College football. 
college football. I, I am in, I'm in sports purgatory right now. And I know there's baseball. I mean, really? I mean, it's compared to college football. And uh, I was looking at Georgia's schedule. Yeah. Yeah, y'all look, y'all probably go undefeated this year. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being funny. Y'all probably go undefeated. I mean, you know. And then. A little tough in SC, but we are. Do what? A little tough in SEC. Oh, know? yeah. It's schools like Vanderbilt. I mean, I mean, they're a powerhouse. I mean. What are y'all talking about? Like, people from, people from Georgia work for people from Vanderbilt, but that's just. Do what? What are y'all powerhouse schools? Yeah, Clemson yeah. Who? See, let's 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 go over national championships in the past few years. I, do you want to do that? You want to do that right now? You want to do that right now? Clemson. Huh? Clemson. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're canceled. Anyway, I, I never canceled anybody. Oh my gosh! Hey, if this is your first time at Second Chance, this is Philip, and he does an amazing job at worship. Doesn't he? That we love him. It, it, Listen, this is, this is proof that we accept anybody because he's a Bulldog fan and we let him on stage. Anyway, um, Philip's wearing a, Phillip's wearing a shirt, lift full, die empty. I'm, I'm wearing one. These are available for purchase if you want to pick one up in the back corner as you leave today. If you don't want one, that's fine. We typically give stuff like this away, but we're selling them this time. And, and, and so, so if someone, well, we need a free T-shirt. Well, in a couple months, you'll have a I love my shirt. My I love my church shirt. There you go. Say that five times fast. Um, and so we're super excited about that. All, if you're a first timer here today, though, this is your first time at Second Chance, or you've been coming for a week or two, but you haven't came by the first timers area yet, would you do that today? Just it, listen, it'll take two or three minutes. You swing by that area. I'm going to be in there. We've got some amazing volunteers. We'd love a chance to meet you, hear a little bit about what brought you to Second Chance. Find out if there's anything that we can be doing for you. Um, and, and I just love the stories I get to hear in that room right there. It absolutely makes my day. So if you have an opportunity, and, 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 and let me just say this. Let me say, first timers, first timers, first time. I, there's always that one person that goes, I want to discuss theology. I don't. I have no desire to do that at all. I want to talk to first timers. I'm going to go eat some barbecue and some ice cream. I'm going to go home and sleep. Amen. All right, so also if you give here at Second Chance, thank you so much because your giving is making a difference. I'm going to be sharing with you over the next month or two some plans that we're going to be making to take some next steps. That's all I'm going to say about it, but our church is taking some next steps just like I challenge you everybody to take their own personal next step. And if you give, um, that, that's a big deal. If you've chosen to put Jesus first in your finances and you do that by giving at this church, I'm telling you, it's not just giving, it's an investment in the kingdom that we're going to see hundreds and thousands of more people come to Christ over the next several years. So thank you. It makes a difference. Y'all stand with me. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing a song. And I know I say this a lot, but so far I'm always right. We're going to sing a song that I think is going to become one of our new favorites. And it's, a, it's actually a, a declaration and a prayer at the same time. So Father, right now, I just want to thank you for every single person in this room, every single person that's watching online. Jesus, you're good to us. Father, I pray that we would never take what we have for granted. And God, that today when we leave, we would say, we had church. We love you and we ask this in your name. Amen.
just for another opportunity to be in your house, God, to worship you, to lift your name up. God, we give you everything we have today, Jesus. We're thankful, God, that we get to come in this place and have church every single week. God, experience your presence. We pray today would be like no other, Jesus. We pray you open our hearts and speak to us today. And God, that your presence will be in this place. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all like it? Good? Yeah. Kind of like, let's have church. I'm like, yeah. I saw some of y'all doing that too. Y'all, let's have church. So a few weeks, we'll be just tearing the roof off of this place. Y'all good with that? Yeah. Good. Um, I know I've asked this question before, um, but it's for illustration purposes. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a second if you can identify with a certain particular group of people. Um, you need to know if you raise your hand, I am going to make fun of you, but you can't lie in church because if you do, you go to hell. So there, so I'm just, I just made that up. So I'm, I'm curious though, and this is, we're going to have some fun, okay, don't worry. Um, how many of you have ever ran out of gas in your car? Just raise your hand, just raise your hand, okay, all over, look around, look around. How? <laughs> I don't understand you. I'm glad you're here. There's a lot of you here. Yeah, you, this, you need second chance, all right? This, I mean, how? There's a, there's a gauge in your car that tells you how far you have. Now, I know some of you like to play the game to see how close to E you can get. That's stupid because you run out of gas. And you're on the side of the road going, I'm a genius, all right? I... <laughs> now, I've done a lot of stupid things. Listen, I've majored in stupid, but one of the things I've never done is ran out of gas. And the reason why is because after I get past half a tank, I start stressing. Anybody like that? Okay, these are the geniuses. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I, one, of the, one of the scariest texts I've ever gotten from Shannon, my wife, I mean, I'm sorry, it wasn't a text, it was a voicemail, she calls me and she leaves me this voicemail. Hey, baby, I just want to let you know um, I'm on E and my light's been on for 20 miles, but I think I'm going to make it. Click. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that's, that's fun? Now, I know gas prices are crazy right now and it's easier to run out of gas, but, but for, for me, it's real simple. Once it gets past half a tank, pull into QT, hello, Fill up, get some pizza, and then, and then you're good. Now, there, there are people in this room. Now, let me ask you another question, another question. When you ran out of gas, at least 80% of y'all have done this, okay? When you ran out of gas, did you say, this car's pathetic. <laughs> it's never going to work again. I might as well go and get another car. Probably not. When you run out of gas, you don't blame the car. The car still has potential. It just lacks power because it doesn't have any gas, right? And so instead of saying, well, I ran out of gas and it's the car's fault and I guess I'm going to have to throw the car away or blow the car up or give the car to or just abandon it and go get another one. No, it's, it's still got all sorts of potential and it still has the power to get you where it needs to be. It just needs gas, right? Now, some of you are like, what in the world does this have to do with God, Jesus, Christianity, or the Bible? Glad you asked. If you had to identify where you were spiritually, and, and, and don't answer out loud, just, just do this in your, in your own heart or your own mind. If you had to identify where you were spiritually, where would you put yourself on this gauge? Because I know a lot of people, a lot of people feel spiritually empty. And this is the thing I know that when, when, you're, when your car gets on empty, can we all admit it's stuck, yes or no? Like it ain't going nowhere unless you push it. When we get spiritually empty, we feel stuck. And some of us, we can let that become a permanent condition. Now, if you're here today and you feel spiritually empty, I, I want to encourage you that this series, during this series, we're going to talk about how to, how to live full. But in order to live full, you got to get full. And so we're going to talk about how to get full because I heard somebody say this and I just resonated with this. One of these days, one of these days, I'm going to die. And when I die, I want to die with 
memories, not hopes and dreams. I want to live full. I want to live my fullest life. And I'm sure you want that as well. You want to live your fullest life. So that's what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. And we're, we're going to do so by focusing on a dude in the Old Testament named Abraham. Anybody know the song, Father Abraham? How many sons? How many, yeah, many sons have Father Abraham? And I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm. Now, I learned this in a Wesleyan church, and this is all the hand raising we ever did. <laughs> we had to get a committee meeting to approve it, all right? So, and if you've never heard that song, thank, you better thank God. In fact, if y'all make me mad, we'll teach it to all the kids one Sunday, and you will, dear. Okay, so anyway, I want to set this story up because, because this is what I know. Nobody wants to be here spiritually. Like, I, I, know this, I know this about you because you're here. If you, if you showed up at church, if, if you're in the room, I know you don't want to be here spiritually. And so today, we're going to talk about how to start moving this needle. Now, this is what I'm not going to promise you. I'm not going to promise you by the end of the message, you're going to be here. But I'm going to promise you, I'm going to show you how we can begin to move the needle and get closer to being full and, and why that matters. Are you ready? Here we go. We're going to talk about, a, now, stay with me for this first part because we're going to feel like we're reading through the Hebrew phone book But because there, there's a lot of names and a lot of people and a lot of stuff, but you got to stay with me because it's all important. Are you ready to go? All right, good. Here we go. This is the account of Terah's family. Like you said, we're talking about Abraham. Wait on it. Told y'all. We got to develop it. Terah was the father of Abram. Now, this is going to be Abraham. God's going to change his name, so we're just going to call him Abraham, so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Abraham. Nahor and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur. <laughs> I've always thought that was a weird place to name a... You know, hey, what are we going to call that city? Ur. That's good. That's good. Let's call it Ur. <laughs> Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Now, during this time, I mean, back in the day, when I say back in the day, we're talking four or 5,000 years ago. If you were born somewhere, that's where you died. You, you did not stray from your family or your subgroup because if you went outside, that there, was, there was safety in staying where you are. There was, there was, you could almost say there was safety in staying stuck. And, and so, so instead, of, instead of going anywhere else, they, and now we don't have that right now in our country. Right now in our country, everybody's moving everywhere. Everybody. Everybody's, everybody's moving out of California, moving out of New York, moving into South Carolina, buying all the houses, driving the home prices up. I mean, it's crazy. I love, I, if you, I'm glad you're here. You, you picked a great state to move to. God bless the USA. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah. Now, we're going, she, God's going to change her name to Sarah, so we're just going to call her Sarah instead of Sarah. So if I mess that up, I didn't mess it up. I'm doing it on purpose, okay? You with me? Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. Everybody got this so far? Good. There we go. But Sarah was unable to become pregnant and had no children. Now, let me pause real quick and kind of walk through this. In this culture and in this time period, if you could not have children, you were looked down upon. Now, in today's society, I know people, and maybe, and you know people, maybe you're one of those people that infertility is something that we struggle with. But fortunately, we have science, and now because of science, there's all kinds of amazing things where couples that were in, in that struggle with infertility can have kids. I mean, it's amazing, but they didn't have that 5,000 years ago. Abraham didn't have Google. Why can't Sarah and I have a kid and couldn't, couldn't Google it? So, so people thought in this time period, if a couple could not have kids, well, there was obviously sin in their lives. There was obviously something wrong. And if it wasn't public, well, I mean, it's not public, but nobody knows what's going on in private. I mean, there's something, something's not right about Abraham and Sarah, because if it was, they would be able to have kids. Don't miss this. 
they got labeled as infertile. They got labeled as disappointing to God. They, you could almost say they got labeled as a sinner. And that'll cause a person to run on empty. There are people in this room right now. And maybe you're not in this room. Maybe you're watching online. And the reason you're watching online is because you went somewhere and you got labeled. You, you, you got labeled. And, and when you walked in the room, you wanted people to see you as a person, but people don't see you as a person. They just know your story. And because of your story, they can't see that you're actually a person with a heart and a soul that matters to God. I mean, I, I, I know that struggle. And, and there are people in this room that, that struggle with that. And you get labeled. Some of this room, some, some, some people in this room, maybe you've accepted the label that other people have put on you. They put a label on Abraham and Sarah. Maybe they labeled you as, you know what, you're an addict. And you're always going to be an addict. And there's nothing you can do. You know what? You have depression. You're always going to have depression. Your mama had depression. Your daddy had depression. You're always, you know what? You struggle with anxiety. You're always going to be anxious. And, and we have let other people speak into us what they think about us so much that it causes us to feel stuck. And when we feel stuck, we think there's no way we can ever move forward quiet in the room that means it's like either hitting a nerve or we need to do another series all right I, I, i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with that's kind of speaking to people now watch this one day Terah took his son Ab abraham and his daughter sarah his son's abraham's wife his grandson lot his son Haran's child and moved away from i mean I, don't you love the de details in the bible and moved away from ur of the chaldeans he was headed for Ca the land of canaan but they stopped at Haran and what's this word say on three? One, two, three? Settled. They settled. And I want you to watch what happens when you're going from point A to point B, but you settle. It might not happen physically, but it'll happen spiritually every time when we settle. Watch what happens. Terah lived for 205 years and died. Anytime we settle, something inside of us dies. Now, I'm, I'm all about, like, having standards. I'm not going to settle, but sometimes those things have to change, right? For example, last week, right after church, got in the truck, drove to the beach. And I've got a rule when I'm driving somewhere. If you're riding with me, you better go pee before, because I ain't stopping 17 times. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Every man in this room right now, I've got you right here. You are with me. But let me tell you why. That GPS time, I got to beat it. <laughs> I don't have to just beat it. I got to shatter it. I, I need my GPS to talk to me and say, you are the best driver in the world. I, and so when you stop and you, you pee, that, that messes the time up. Can we get a Coke? No, we can't get a Coke. It's going to take more time. No, just go. So anyway, I, was, I told Shannon and Karis, driving down, I was like, we're not stopping. And we didn't. We, and on the way back, I was like, hey, we're not stopping. We're not stopping. One hour in, Shannon was like, baby. <laughs> I got the potty. I said, tough. I didn't. I didn't say that. I, I didn't or I wouldn't be here right now. I said, yes, ma'am, and pulled over. We were in Alabama, um, and uh, we walked in, and we're like, hey, y'all got any bathrooms? And the guy was like, nope, but we got some porta potties around the side. <laughs> Shannon was like, I don't care. I was like, me either. So, but but that, that was my thing. I was like, I'm not going to settle, but all of a sudden, I had to settle. And sometimes it's not settling. Sometimes it's saving your own life. Am I right, guys? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? See, see, the deal was that, that Terah settled. He was on his way to what, what would eventually become the promised land, but he, he settled. He, he settled and he died. And, and one of the things that keeps us on empty is we settle for the way things are. Well, this is, 
I, I guess this is who I am. I guess what happened to me is going to define me for the rest of my life. I guess this is what I do. And so if, if I'm going to accept that label, if I'm going to take in everybody saying, everything everybody's saying to me and about me, and I settle eventually spiritually, we will die. Now we're getting to the good part. So Tara's dead, and the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 12, watch. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. <laughs> now, when we read the Bible, I, I say this a lot, we read it with like, we know what happened in the story. Abraham had not read Genesis 12. And I don't know about you, but if you, if you came up to me and said, Hey, Pastor P, let's go for a ride in my car. And I said, where are we going? And you said, you'll know when we get there. I'd be like, I ain't getting in your car. <laughs> Pastor P, we're going to go to a restaurant. What restaurant are we going to? You'll know when we get there. You eating by yourself, <laughs> right? I need a little bit more information. It's because I'm a... I'm a bit of a control freak, and I don't trust a lot of people, okay? So when, when this pops up, Abraham, I want, you to, I want you to take a walk with me. Where are we going? I'll let you know when we get there. Now, the reason God's telling Abraham that is, number one, there's, Abraham couldn't imagine what God had prepared for him. But, but notice this, and this is not going to be a spoiler for most people. Abraham and Sarah eventually get pregnant in their 90s, have a child named Isaac who goes on to have Jacob, who goes on to have 12 sons who become the, eventually the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. I mean, this is unbelievable. Abraham couldn't have comprehended that. So what God is telling Abraham and Sarah, don't miss this, is said, Abraham and Sarah, I want to do something in you that will blow your mind. You, you've got greatness in you, Abraham. You've got greatness in you, Sarah, but I'm not going to do the miracle if you stay where you are. If you want to receive my blessings and you want to receive my promises, I need you to walk with me. And as you walk with me, I will develop you into who you need to become, and eventually you will see immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. But if you stay where you are, if you stay in the environment that has labeled you and limited you, you will be on empty for the rest of your life. And that's the same thing that God says to us. If we stay in the environment that labels and limits us, we will never step into, but God says, hey, Abram, I just want you to, I just want you to walk with me. What does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. I, one morning, this is like four or five years ago, I woke up and I did what most of us do before we wake up. I checked my phone. I, checked, I got, I literally have 10 text messages right now. I'm preaching. I can't even respond. This one person's on staff. Why are you texting me right now? You know who you are. I got up and, and I got my phone and I started looking at Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. We didn't have TikTok yet. Started looking at all social media, started posting stuff, started replying. By the time, on this particular morning, I just happened to notice what time it was when I got up. And I looked, after I got done with all my tweeting and replying and all this other, I had been in bed for over an hour. Now, I know none of y'all have ever done this, but you know people and you're praying for them. I, I know, I know. But I remember that morning, that morning I made a decision. It was a snap decision. It was just this thing. I said, you know what? No more. I, I'm not 
going to give this my attention first thing. Now, let me pause. This is not an anti-phone message. This is not an anti-social media message. I can't stand it when pastors and leaders preach about you shouldn't have social media on your phone. And then they have entire social media teams that run their accounts and they're posting 17 times a day. I'm like, hello, hypocrite, okay? If you think you shouldn't have social media, then you should stop posting on social media. Another message, another time, sorry, chased a rabbit. I said, no, no, no more. I, I said, I'm, I'm going to give my first, I'm going to give my first time in the day to the Lord. Now, let me ask you this question. What would happen if you gave God the first 10 minutes of your day every day? How, what, 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 now I know somebody's here going, I give him an hour. Okay, praise God. We're going to make you a saint next week and we will sing you a worship song to you about you because you're amazing. But for the rest of us, what would it look like to get, to listen, to intentionally get out of bed? I have my quiet time in bed. No, no, you don't. You get out of bed, you go somewhere in your house, you sit down, you read your Bible, maybe a, maybe a chapter, maybe a few verses, you pray for the people closest to you, ask God to fill you with wisdom for the day. How much better could that be than staring at her phone for the first 30, 45 minutes of, of the day? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you. It will begin to move the dial from empty to full. It don't happen overnight. I'm just, I'm just trying, what would, it, what would it take for you to do that for a week? Do it for a week and then just see how you feel about life spiritually at the end of that week. Because God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want, you to, I want you to walk with me. I want you to leave the land where they've labeled you. I want you to leave the land where you've accepted those labels. There's greatness in you that I want to bring out of you, but you're only gonna receive it if you walk with me. Then he says this, this is, this is great. He said, I will make you, I will make you into a great nation. This is the first time that God hints that Abraham's going to have kids. I'm going to make you into a great nation. By the way, Israel is a great nation. I've been there many times. It's phenomenal. It's, a, it's an incredible place to go. So, so God got it right on this and everything else he said. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will make you into a great, I will make you into a great nation. I start thinking, I, I break everything down too. I talked about crumble cookies last week. Anybody go get some? Anybody go get some crumble cookies? Where, where, did I lie? No, I didn't lie. I'm not going to lead you astray in food or theology. <laughs> I brought one this week. Actually, I brought three. Some of you are like, oh, I love it when you have those food illustrations. He gives it away. I ain't giving this away. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm showing you this for, for a reason. Everybody, everybody see this? It's a chocolate chip cookie. I'm going to break it open. Look at this. Look at look. Oh, it's, oh, man. Now, I'm going to share something with y'all, and you're going to have to stay with me for a second because I'm, I'm going to need to kind of teach it out. God has never made a chocolate chip cookie. He hasn't. There, I know there's somebody here, he made manna. It's not the same. God did not make this cookie. If you were to walk up to me and say, Pastor P., Where'd you get that cookie? And I went, it's all God. It's just all God. Y'all would say, I think Pastor P's back on the bottle. It's not all, like no, nobody thinks it's all. Now, let me say this. God made the ingredients for the cookie. God gave somebody the idea 
For the, I do believe it was heavenly inspired. Have you ever had a good chocolate chip cookie? That came straight from God. The devil got involved and put calories in it, but, but when, 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 God, when the original idea was good, God gave somebody the idea to open up a cookie store. God gave, like, like God gave, God put all the ingredients together, but God didn't make the cookie. He just gave the ingredients. When you see somebody that has a phenomenal life and you say, how did you get away? They go, it's all God. That's a humble brag. It's not all God. If it was all God, then everybody would have a phenomenal life. God gave every single person the ingredients to have an amazing life. But see, those ingredients don't come together in the mixing bowl and start getting all beat up and everything. They, they don't come together until we start walking with him. And as we walk with God, he will make us into something great. As we walk with him, he said, I will make you into a great nation as you walk with me. You keep walking, you keep becoming. You keep walking, you keep becoming. You stop walking, you're stuck. But if you keep walking, you're because there's going to be days, Abraham, and you wake up and you don't want to walk. And on those days, keep walking. There's going to be days, Abraham, where you wake up and people are telling you you're stupid. You just keep walking. You keep walking, and I will keep making you into something greater than you could ever imagine. That's God's promise for Abraham. That's God's promise for us today. <laughs> then he said, then he said, I will bless you and make you famous. Make you famous. Make you famous. He didn't lie. Today, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all trace their beginning back to Abraham. God made him famous. God said, one day, Abraham, people in Belarus and Belize and Belton <laughs> are all going to know your name. Isn't that crazy? God said, I'll make you famous. Did, did God follow through on his promise to Abraham? He'll follow through on his promise to you too. He will. He said, I'll make you famous and bless you. And then he said this. And this, is, this, is, this part for me, this was like therapy. He said, he said, I will bless those who bless you because as you're walking and as you're becoming who God wants you to be, there's going to be people along the way they are going to walk with you and they're going to cheer you along. And God said, you don't have to worry about blessing those people. I'm going to bless them for you. You just walk with me and I'll bless people that cheer you on. And Abraham was like, what about the haters? And God's like, oh, and, I, and I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. God said, I'll, I'll, handle, I'll handle your haters. Back in, I guess it was 2006, 2007, Twitter was just becoming popular. We didn't even have Instagram yet. And only college students used Facebook. I know that's crazy because only senior adults use Facebook now. But, but I was just college students were on. So, and I had... I was sitting on my computer, and a friend of mine came in. He goes, hey, man, I just see you're online. You want to look at my Twitter? I was like, no, nah, I got software on my computer that blocks me from looking at people's Twitters. That, I'm not supposed to do that. That's not. He's like, no, stupid. That's a, it's a saw. I was like, yeah, I knew that, whatever. So anyway, he showed me how to tweet. And so I was like, man, this is fun. You can just kind of share encouragement, and you can share thoughts, and you can share ideas. And it took about three days for Bible Boy 182. <laughs> now, I just want to pause, and I just want to ask the question. I just want to ask the question, has anybody in the room ever received anything hateful via email, text, or social media. Just raise your hand. Just, okay, that's most people. Doesn't, doesn't that bother you a little bit? This is what, oh, don't let that bother you. Okay. What if I just slapped you in the face and said, don't let that bother you? <laughs> I mean, 
I remember I was I was online and and I started getting some hate. And you know, you know what I did? I engaged with the haters. And you know what? God's basically saying right here, Abraham, let me handle the hate. You keep walking. Because if you stop to handle your haters, then you stop moving forward. And you know what happens when you stop to handle your haters? You, your wheels start spinning and you'll eventually run out of gas. Because you're so focused on your haters, you, you, we can't focus on what. So today, I, I just don't engage. And you know, do you know how hard it is for me to not engage? It's not because I don't have something to say. I've got an app on my phone that I have typed out some amazing replies. <laughs> you will never see it, ever. I mean, literally, somebody's like, oh, you're a heretic. <laughs> I'm like, it's not what your mom said. That, that, that's what I want to say. That, that's just in my heart. I, I, I know I've got, I'm not where I need to be in my wall with Jesus, okay? I just pulled everybody back in. If I lost you, you were like, oh, you're talking about my mama. But, but if, you, if you're going to, listen, if you're going to leave the place where they labeled you and you're going to walk out of their label that they put on you, you're going to get some hate because people don't want you, like these people right here, they don't want you to advance. They want to hold you back. So if you're going to move from empty, to, like empty people want you to stay empty. And as you start walking with God and as we start becoming like filled with his word and knowledge and his spirit, they're going to try to hate, they're going to try to hate. And God said, God said, Abraham, you just walk and I'll handle your haters. And for me, when I was writing this message, I wrote down this little side note that I wanted to keep for myself and I want to share it with you. I wrote down, if I had listened to the haters, I would be living in a life that I hate. And that's true for you too. Now, let me pause. I didn't say this in the last service, but, but I love this one a little bit more so y'all get bonus material. <laughs> a hater is not someone that loves you and, and like speaks some really good, awesome truth to you in private. A hater is somebody that you don't know that's giving you unsolicited opinions about stuff they don't know. We good? All right, let's keep going. So Abram departed. God spoke less than 100 words. And he was like, all right, saddle up, boys. Let's go. As the Lord had instructed. And Lot went with him. Let me pause to say this. Not everybody starts the journey. We'll finish the journey with you. Lot caused Abram, Abraham to go completely redneck. In two weeks, the title of the message is Redneck. I'm telling y'all right now, we are opening the service with a song from Blake Shelton called The Boys Round Here. I'm telling y'all right now. So no, I, I'm, I'm, okay? Like, it, it, well, I can't believe, well, I, listen, we'll do Highway to Hell on Easter and just make it everybody happy, all right? I'm just telling y'all, it's going to happen. I, w I was gonna tell people to dress like a redneck, but most of us have that down already, all right? So... Oh, yeah, so Lot went with him. Watch this. Abram was, Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. I don't know about you, but, okay, the quick survey. How many people in their 20s? Raise your hand. You're in your 20s, 20s, 30s, 30s, raise your hand, 30s, 40s, 50s. Oh, a lot of, lot of us, a lot of us, 60s. 70s? Okay, for those of you with your hands raised right now in your 70s. When you, I'm, just, I'm just guessing, when you get to 70, aren't we supposed to like slow it down a little bit? I mean, just a little bit, just a little bit. I'm not saying quit, I'm just like, and I don't know about you, but when I get, when I, when I turn 75, I want to be on some beach <laughs> somewhere with my toes in the water and my, okay, you know, I, we got it, we got it. I know who listens to Zach Brown Band. So, 
75. 75. By the way, Abram, you're going to be a dad. Nobody, not, not a man in this room is like, hey, what's your goal when you become 75? I think I want to pop out some kids. Hey, 75? <laughs> Do the math. What, you'll be like 93 when they graduate from high school? Rolling up in the air. You know, yes. <laughs> 75. I'm just, I'm just asking the question for... for, for Audience participation. Can, can we all agree that's all? Okay, yeah. I know you didn't want to say it, especially if somebody next to you raised their hand. But if you were in your 70s, I mean, that's. He took his wife, Sarah, which is good because God's blessings have a lot to do with our connection with God and our connection with other people. You can't, you can't get full on your own. It, it takes other people on the journey to help fill us up, Right? Um, he took his nephew Lot and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household. He had people. That's, that's pretty, I don't, I don't know what that's like, but he had people. And he headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, now, let me just pause. The Bible just kind of throws that in there, and the, ori- the, the original audience would have understood. When they, this, this journey took several months and was several hundreds of miles and they covered it on foot. Abram just walked with God. Every day he got up and walked with God. And the closer he got to Canaan, the further he got away from the land that labeled him infertile. Isn't that great? And and Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the oak of Morah. Y'all, y'all know where that is. At the time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Watch this. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I will give this land to your descendants. Abraham, you're going to have some kids. And I'm going to give them this land. I know what some of y'all think. He only had one kid. No, he actually had two. We'll talk about that the last week of the series. He had two. They're still fighting. They really are. And Abram built an altar and there dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, let, let, let me show you this. This is, this is so cool. Abram built an altar. And then he gave. You know why he gave? Because he was full. When you become filled spiritually, something happens in you called the overflow. And when you start living out of the overflow, you're a giver. Now, that doesn't just mean money. Everybody just tensed up. That, that does, it includes it. But it means when you walk into a room, you're not taking, you're giving. You're, you're giving encouragement. You're giving hope. You're, when, you, when, when you become full, as a result of walking with God, you don't have to tell people you're full. They just see it because you become a giving person. And this happened when Abraham was started when he's 75. Can we all agree that's late for God to do something new? It, it reminded me of something. Now, I'm going to shut it down with this, but relax. This il- the closing illustration takes at least 30 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful for college football, and Philip and I joke about it a lot, but I, listen, I will watch two teams that I don't even know. I just love the game. But back in 2020, they decided to have the season, even though COVID was going on, and I was so thankful. And, and Clemson, if you're a Clemson fan, you'll remember this game. Clemson was playing Boston College at home, and we, I say we like I was on the field, but we, as Clemson, we were down 18 at halftime. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? And, and the team, and I was watching, I had a group of friends at my house, completely breaking COVID protocol because I didn't care. Um, and I had a group of friends at my house who were watching it, and they went into halftime, and I went, we're going to be all right. They're like, I love your optimism. I'm like, nah, we're going to come out, we're going to win this thing. We're going to win it in the second half. That's what we're going to do. Now, 
Now, if you're a Carolina fan, you can't understand that because you leave. <laughs> they added on to Williams Bryce this offseason. They built more exits so y'all can get out quicker, all right? But, but Clemson fans, we, we, I said, we're going to come back. If you remember the game, we did. And, and somebody in the room, I know we're getting, somebody in the room said, I, what, I wish I knew what Dabo said to them at halftime. I said, I can tell you exactly what Dabo said at halftime. They said, were you in the locker room? I said, no, I was not in the locker room, but I have been in the locker room on several occasions with the Clemson football team at halftime, and Dabo says the same thing every time at halftime. Now, the last time I communicated with him, he still said he said the same thing. He says the same thing. It doesn't matter if they're up by 18 or down by 18. Dabo is going to tell his team the same thing every, th every time at halftime. This is what the great theologian Dabo Sweeney says. <laughs> there is nothing more insignificant in college football than the score at halftime. That's good, isn't it? Because he, he, he tells the team, hey, if you're winning by a lot, don't, don't get comfortable because that other team could come back on you. And if you're down by a lot, hey, don't worry about it because we can play ourselves. But there's nothing more insignificant than the score at halftime. Some of you are like, Perry, I didn't come to hear about Clemson football and halftime and why are you bringing all this up? It's, it's real simple. Abraham thought his life was over. He was in halftime. Abraham thought life was done and he was 75 with no kids. It's, there's no way something great could happen for Abraham. And God said, you've been in halftime. Let's play the third and the fourth quarter. And the third and fourth quarter of his life resulted in ultimately Jesus coming about who paid for our sin. I would say he played a good second half. Here's why I bring that up. Six years ago today, this was the headline. Six years ago today. I don't have anything negative to say about New Spring from the stage. I don't. I spent 16 years of my life at that church. Some of the best times of my life I had at that church. I was able to be a part of something at that church where I saw Jesus do some amazing things and I don't regret one ounce of time, energy, effort, or money I dedicated at New Spring Church. That was a great season. But when I got fired, I thought it was over. I was by myself on this day six years ago in an apartment that a friend was letting me stay in watching the announcement of my firing online. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's pretty humbling. And I thought it was over. And, and the main voices in my life that were speaking into me, except for a few, were all telling me it was, it was over. That because of this, I was done. But you know what I've discovered? It was halftime. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you how I know. And I know some of y'all think, in fact, I'm gonna get asked after the message, is this story you're about to tell true? I don't make stuff up. About two or three weeks ago, I was preparing for this particular message. When I get done, I go down and get on my treadmill. I got a treadmill in my garage. I open the garage door. Whatever temperature it is outside, that's, that's, where, that's how I run. So lately, I've been sweating like a sinner in church, all right? I mean, it's just, it's just it's incredible. And I was, on my, I was on my treadmill having my good little run. And I'm listening to a preacher, and this preacher was into it. And it, it just uh, on podcast. 
he was like shucking the corn and shelling the peas and bringing it home. And, and then have you, ever, have you ever been in a message or been listening to a podcast and you were like, he's got a camera in my house. He knows what I'm doing. My wife called him. Like what? So I'm, I'm running, I'm sitting there running. And he said this. He said, somebody is listening to me right now and you are somewhere between the ages of 45 and 55. And I went, well, that's me. And he said, you've done some stuff in your life that's completely dumb. I'm like, well, that's me. He said, and you think it's over. But God is speaking to me right now and he's telling me to tell somebody it's halftime. You got another half to play. And the second half is going to be better than the first half. And I was like, amen, amen. It gets crazier. The next day, the next day, I'm running. Different podcast, different church. In fact, the two people out, they don't even know each other. I'm running. Completely different subject toward the end of the message. The guy's like, There's somebody here between the ages of 50 and 60. Well, I fall into that category. And he said, God wanted me to tell you something. You think your life is over because you've done some dumb stuff, but you're just at halftime. I got off the treadmill and just had myself a cry right there. Because, because listen, if you're here, I, I know what that feels like. And just because, just because your mess up wasn't as public as mine doesn't mean it didn't hurt as much as mine. But this is what I feel like God's spoken to me and this is what I feel like God's saying to somebody in this room. It's not over. Abram was 75 and God said, let's get it started. It's not over. You're at halftime. As for me, listen, That second quarter, the last five minutes of the second quarter, I threw some interceptions, I fumbled the ball, I kicked a field goal for the other team because I was drunk. I did some stupid stuff in the last five minutes, but I went to rehab at halftime. And at halftime, I I got some people around me that could speak life into me. At halftime, God gave me the idea to start this thing called Second Chance Church. At halftime, God told me, I'm not finished with you yet. And if God did that for me, he'll do it for you. Somebody here thinks it's over, that, that it's done, but you're not done because God said, I will give you immeasurably more than all you ever ask or imagine. Somebody here needs to hear me. It's halftime. It's halftime. God's not through with you. If you're not dead, he's not done. He will never leave you. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. I think we need to take just 10 seconds and let him know how much we love him and how thankful we are for him and how grateful we are for second chances.
Jesus, thank you so much that you are the God of immeasurably more. The six years ago, I thought it was done. And today you give me the privilege of standing on a stage and singing, let's have church. You're so good. And God, I know what you've done for me is God, what you want to do for, for, for those who belong to you. With heads bowed and eyes closed right now, Je Jesus wants better things for us than we actually want for ourselves. And today, when you leave, don't leave with a thought in mind that I am the hero of this story, because I'm not. I'm an example of how God can take a messed up, screwed up, jacked up person and slowly but surely, and listen, I'm in the process of becoming who he wants me to be. Maybe you need to tell God right now, God, I'll give you the first 10 minutes of my day. I'm gonna do it for a week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it out. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and you realize that's what you need to do today. You need Jesus to come into your life. You need to give him all your sin and just let him save you. And if that's you today and you need to give your life to Christ, I want to lead you in a salvation prayer right now. You can pray this right where you're standing. Just pray it in your heart. Just say, Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay for my sins. And right now, Jesus, I receive you into my life. Come in and take over. I surrender everything to you in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer, if you just asked Christ to come in your life, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now. So if you just prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to come in your life, would you do me a favor? Put your hands straight up in the air. Hold it up really high. Amen. 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 Hands. Amen. 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 Father, I want to thank you for these hands of the people that have just prayed to receive you, of the lives that you have changed. Father, I pray that as they walk out of this place today, they would walk out knowing that they crossed over from death to life and stepped into the immeasurably more that you have for them. God, help us this week to put you first, to walk with you, that we would be a church that walks with you. And God, as we walk out of this place, we would know that we just had church. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Everybody that agreed said amen and amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Me too. Y'all have a great week.